Only weeks ago, my lord husband was alive, and the realm was at peace. You're afraid, sir? Worse. I'm rational. My father believed that I was meant to unite the realm. You might be half the king your father was. Tread carefully. Or what? All who refuse will have their death. I needed to know that there was no other path. I know I do. Hold to your courage! Hold to your wits! There will be no mercy! He sent the dragons to war. The horrors I have just loosed cannot be for a crown alone. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my House of the Dragons Season 2, Episode 4 trailer video. We're finally getting the battle at Rook's Rest. There are a couple other battles that it seems like we see during that Episode 2, just based on the progression from the books. There are a couple other battles that just have to happen before Rook's Rest. There's a bunch of stuff going on, a bunch of Easter eggs, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. While I was making this video, something pretty big actually happened to one of the directors of the episode. Now, not George R. Martin, not the showrunners, just one of the directors of the episode completely separately, like not in the behind the scenes or any of the House the Dragons built stuff that they released for the episodes, said that three of these dragon eggs are supposed to be Daenerys' dragon eggs, which does fly in the face of pre-existing Fire and Blood book canon, the way that George R. R. Martin set it up. So what'll probably happen, because there's like a small uproar of people seeing this interview with the director, but not the showrunner, not George R. R. Martin, is that people will go to them for clarification. So hopefully within the next couple of days, they'll either say, yes we intended for these eggs to be Daenerys's dragon eggs or no we did not intend for that if the red gold and green dragon eggs in this clutch here are Daenerys's dragon eggs or wind up becoming Daenerys's dragon eggs that would mean the blue dragon egg would have to be baby Viserys's dragon egg that she mentioned so by default that means that they wouldn't be doing Reyna's dragon from the books mourning it's always possible that they also give her story from one of the other characters in the Fire and Blood books because they've been moving characters around changing story from the books for a lot of the people that are on the show right now. But like I said, in the next couple of days, hopefully the showrunner George R. R. Martin will clarify this detail with Daenerys' dragon eggs. Just starting at the beginning of the trailer, like they break up the battle at Rook's Rest during a couple different scenes and a little bit of the sack of Duskendale. So I'll explain the progression of the battles during the episode just based on the trailer footage. They reference the path that the Green Army is taking, Kristen Cole's forces that he's leading. They get bigger as they go along, too. Like, they're basically absorbing forces as they go along. People bend the knee or they conquer other forces. So the small force that you saw leaving King's Landing during Episode 3 gets bigger by the time they get to Rook's Rest. That's why there's so many extra banners in the force coming out of the tree line here at Rook's Rest. But during episode 3, they explained that their path was going to go through Rosby and Stokeworth. Those two houses basically bend the knee to the Green Army, and they just absorb them. So how Stokeworth is the green sigil here with the white sheep on it. The banner with the three red lines is House Rosby, the other house that bent the knee. Like the first two that they passed through on their way to Duskendale. And it seems here like Kristen Cole is executing Gunther Darkland here just based on the yellow and red colors, who also show up as part of the Green Army later when they're leaving the tree line at Rook's Rest, meaning that once the Green Army sacked Duskendale, they just absorbed their forces. Basically, Kristen Cole is going after all the houses that declared for Rhaenyra and either destroying them, forcing them to bend the knee, absorbing their forces till they get to Rook's Rest when they're much, much larger. This is where they start at the beginning of the trailer, as you get that voiceover from Alice in Hightower. You're seeing Lord Staunton's men look out at the tree line as the Green Army are slowly coming out. You remember during Episode 3, he told Rhaenyra, while well, he was on the Black Council, I need to go back to House Stokeworth and prepare for the Green Army to come. Cut to an episode later, and they have arrived. It seems like Allison is in the middle of having this conversation with Lara Strong, because you can see his cane here, Lord Footstuff. She's in a very foot-ready kind of position. She just learned the truth from Rhaenyra about the prophecy of the prince who was promised and that Viserys was talking about Aegon the Conqueror in the prophecy of the Long Night, the White Walkers, the Night King, and not Aegon II. So everything that she did in Season 1, Episode 9 to help them put Aegon II on the Iron Throne, usurping it from Rhaenyra, is based on a lie. She's kind of shaken by that a little bit. But she told Rhaenyra at the end of Episode 3 that it was too late, like nobody on the Green Council would listen to her anymore. They basically were treating her like she doesn't exist anymore. It's not clear if that also extends to Laris Strong here too, like if she's going to tell him the truth about what Viserys actually meant on his deathbed. 
But it sounds like the conversation she's in the middle of having with Lara Strong here is similar to what she was talking to about Rhaenyra. Like, just a little while ago, Viserys was still alive, things were going good. They keep flashing back to the battle at Rook's Rest with the Green Army. You start to see some of the Aegon's banners, too. It's his new banner that he's redesigned from the traditional black and red Targaryen banner. It's the gold sigil on the green banner. Then we see Alicent calling out Aegon for being a terrible king, kind of getting drunk like she doesn't care anymore. Like, what are you going to do to me if I call you a terrible king? You going to throw me in the black cells? You going to have me executed too? Part of the idea is that Tom Glenn Carney, who plays Aegon on the show, says he's slowly realizing that he can do whatever he wants because he's king now and people will just do what he tells them to do. He's been slowly surrounding himself with a bunch of yes men. And at least in the actor's mind, the reason why he picked Kristen Cole to be Hand of the King is because he wanted a strong warrior, but not a good politician because he didn't want, get this, someone to outshine him. That seemed weird for the actor to say something like that. Maybe what he was talking about is the idea that Otto Hightower was able to push him around just because he was a much stronger, much smarter person or a stronger personality. But basically, Kristen Cole, probably the worst hand of the king that you could probably appoint in a situation like this. Like, they're only going to make things worse. On top of that, the actor also confirmed this too, is that Aegon has this incredible inferiority complex. That's what all those scenes during episode 3 about him wanting to go to battle, wearing Aegon the Conqueror's armor, his Valyrian armor no less. I hear a lot about Valyrian steel armor. But it felt like that was something that Aegon the Conqueror would have had from his time in old Valyria as like a House Targaryen family heirloom. The minute he said he was going to wear that Valyrian armor, it made me think of Euron Greyjoy from the books. There was this whole reference during Winds of Winter preview chapter that George R. R. Martin released many years ago at this point about a vision of Euron Greyjoy sitting on the Iron Throne wearing a suit of Valyrian armor. But because on the House of the Dragon show, we're so much closer to the lifespan of actual Aegon the Conqueror, like he didn't die that long ago, a lot of their artifacts, like the Targaryen family holdings, all this Valyrian steel that they possess, different weapons and armor, are still around. Yet to imagine by the time of Robert's Rebellion, the events of the main show, it's either been picked over by other houses or just stolen outright. Just because it is so rare and worth so much money. And it seems like since episode 3, they convinced him to stay. He's just been getting so bored that eventually he can't stand it anymore and leaves on Sunfire to join the battle at Rook's Rest. There's a bunch of new scenes of Gwen Hightower. Remember, Lord Bottomtooth, rich kid who just spoiled and can't stand being at battle for too long here, who seems like he's been roughed up during the lesser battles on their way to Rook's Rest. When he starts speaking out against Kristen Cole while he's on his horse here in camp, it seems like he's advocating caution, and maybe Kristen Cole just admonishes him or like smacks him around a little bit. It's probably Gwen Hightower telling him that he wants to go home to King's Landing, like, let's just go back now, we've won enough battles, let's go back. How do you make Kristen Cole one of the worst people in a Game of Thrones lore, like, worst person ever, seem like a slightly better person? You introduce someone like Gwen Hightower, who you hate even more. Somebody slap that kid around. Then we get our first look at Vagar this season, Aemon finally joining the Green Army in the field at Rook's Rest. Notice this is probably because they think Aegon, Sunfire, Dreamfire are still in the Dragon Pit, and they can use them to defend King's Landing, so they're okay with Aemon leaving the city with Vagar, because technically that would leave it undefended. You wonder what's going to happen with Aegon leaving the city on Sunfire too. Like, it's not like Helena's going to hop on Dreamfire and turn into this great warrior. She spends most of her day in a fugue dream state, not really knowing what's reality and what's dream. The way they cut this, it looks like we see Vagar fighting Rainies and Melees at Rook's Rest. We get a couple scenes of Daemon still at Harrenhal, still having more new visions, this time of the Iron Throne and King's Landing. Now we know these are just plain old visions, like he's not having dragon dreams. The way the showrunner talked about them too, he said that it's Daemon being forced to confront all of his past failures, his shortcomings. The way he saw the younger version of Rhaenyra who told him that she always had to clean up after his messes, showing him the dead Prince Jaehaerys. Really cool seeing that Millie Alcock cameo scene. In present day, like right now as of me posting this video, she's actually filming Supergirl scenes supposedly on the new Superman movie. If you didn't know, Millie Alcock is going to be James Gunn's new DCU version of Supergirl. She's going to be doing her own Supergirl movie that will release in 2026. Probably going to be a while before we get a trailer for that. And because Damon's being confronted by this younger version of Rhaenyra, she's meant to be the version of Rhaenyra that actually loved him during that time period. This vision also evokes a lot of the same imagery from season one, episode one, when she entered the throne room and he was sitting on the Iron Throne pretending to be king. That's probably what this vision is all about, like he's being forced to remember that. Notice while he's seeing this vision, we get the voiceover from Rhaenyra they cut in, probably from a totally different scene, 
talking about her father Viserys and why he chose her to be queen above all else and told her the prophecy of the Long Night because she's supposed to unite the realm and help protect against the next Long Night, the White Walkers, the Night King eventually. She doesn't really want the Iron Throne for selfish reasons. Like she doesn't care about being queen for being queen's sake for the good parts. Like Aegon wants to be king because he just likes having all the authority. Then we get a scene of Rhaenys in the Dragonmont walking out, getting ready to mount on melees and head to Rook's Rest. Part of the idea with Rook's Rest too is that Kristen Cole was trying to lay a trap specifically for Rhaenyra, but it was melees and Rhaenys that came instead of Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra says she needs to know that there's no other path, no other option to her before she calls for war and sends the dragons out to fight. That's what she's talking about. The idea has been that she's been looking for other peaceful ways to solve this, and that was what her last scene with Allison in episode 3 was all about, realizing that it was too late to have a peaceful settlement. Like, there's no other way around this. It has to be war. This is Rhaenyra talking to Jace in front of what looks like Meraxes' dragon skull in the library dragonstone. I absolutely love this set that they built for the library dragonstone. Like they said, it's full of Valyrian history, top to bottom. And even though I don't think they're actually going to do this, the cool thing is that all those documents, like all the books, all that writing there is real stuff that they had to create, like actual lore that they had to develop with help from George R. Martin. So it's like them developing a bunch more material for World of Ice and Fire or Fire and Blood, like just really cool stuff that it'd be cool to actually get in book form if they publish it at some point. This is also one of the ways that we found out that Dannis the Dreamer was one of Balerion the Black Dread's first writers during the age of Old Valyria before the Doom. There was a Valyrian book that Viserys had in his chambers, which are now Aegon's chambers, before he smashed that model of the ancient Valyrian freehold. Maybe someday George R. R. Martin will just publish a lot of that extra stuff. Part of me also thinks that they're waiting to do an actual TV series based in Old Valyria at some point, and they're just saving a lot of the info dumps and lore for that. Like, you know, we'll just tell everybody how this all worked when that show comes out. What's probably going on here with Jace is that he wants to go to Rook's Rest and fight too because all the dragons are starting to enter battle, but he's actually really important for the sowing of the seeds and the finding of the dragon seeds. That's basically what that is. Them looking for any of the Targaryen bastards or Valerian bastards with Valerian blood in their veins and can actually ride a dragon. That'll probably wind up being like episode 6, episode 7 kind of stuff. Because I think the idea during episode 4 is that we get a couple battles through like the Sack of Duskendale. And then most of the episode will be this giant battle episode at Rook's Rest. So that doesn't leave a lot of time for them to do the sowing of the seeds. But I think they'll just save that for like episode 6 or episode 7. We got a little teaser for the dragon scenes, especially with Ulf White, who revealed that he's actually Balon the Brave's bastard son, the brother or the half-brother of Daemon and Viserys. It'll be interesting to see if Daemon winds up learning about him eventually. When she says the horrors she's just let loose, she means she's sending the dragons to war. You also see Aemon on Vagar entering the battle, leaving the tree line. You have to remember that Vagar is still the biggest, most powerful dragon in all of Westeros. She's also the slowest dragon. And the idea is that they also have Sunfire Aegon there, who's not really a great fighter. Sunfire is faster, though, and they're facing against Melees and Rainies. And the difference there is even though she's on a much smaller dragon, she's also much quicker and she's a much better fighter than both Aemon and Aegon. But it's basically going to be a two-on-one dragon battle. Don't want to get too deep into that, but if you haven't read the books, all the materials at this, so you can actually read what happens at that battle at Rook's Rest right now if you actually want to. George R. R. Martin made it sound like they're going to do four seasons, so we'll see how they pace out season three as well, too. Like, there's just, like, a lot of really big stuff that they still have left to do in the actual Dance of the Dragons. But that's one of the reasons why season two seems like it's only taking place over a short period of time. Like, it still has only been a couple weeks since Viserys died. Yet remember, the actual Dance of the Dragons conflict, the actual fighting itself, only took place over the period of a couple years. So it does make more sense why they would stretch out seasons over a short period of time. Like, we get eight episodes, but it only covers a couple weeks worth of time. If there's any other Easter eggs or references that you spotted in the trailer that I didn't talk about in the video, just write it below in the comments. Or if you have any questions or bonus video requests, there's still a couple big bonus videos that I'm working on right now. I'll try to post those as soon as possible. Everybody click here for my full House of the Dragon Season 2 Episode 3 video, and click here for all my other episode videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.